History Town is made possible by... It's 1862. You are hand-digging through layers of frustrating gravel, hoping and praying the next shovel stroke will expose a fortune in gold. Everyone says it's crazy, but there's too much at stake. Then, just when the outcome seems impossibly bleak, the ground begins to pay. The lead is struck, and the greatest creekside placer gold deposit the world has ever seen is suddenly yours for the taking. This is Barkerville's story. For more information, visit barkerville.ca. Barkerville, a national historic site of Canada. You found History Town. You found History Town. You found History Town. You found History Town. Hey, you found History Town. Nice one. Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the History Town Podcast. I am your host, Matthew Quick. Now, before we begin this week's episode, I would like to start by saying that History Town is a fan-supported podcast. So, please, we ask that if you like this episode, share, like, retweet. And also, if you know people that have been interpreters or have been working as historians, I'd like to hear from them. And you can reach me at info at historytown.ca, or you can email me directly at matt at historytown.ca. Also, we are on Twitter at history underscore town. Feel free to give me a shout, tweet me, hit me up. I'd now like to welcome to the show, he is the manager of visitor experiences in Barkerville. He's also a good friend of mine. I'd like to welcome James Douglas. James Douglas, how are you doing today? I am doing very well today, Matt. How are you? I'm doing well. Now that you are in the middle of Artswell's weekend, so a lot of visitors must be crossing through your gates today. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, we we did very well yesterday. We beat the previous year's record by more than two hundred people. So um, we were up over twelve hundred yesterday. We expect to probably equal that again today. So it will be a very busy busy day here in British Columbia's Gold Rush Town and Park. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, you recommended last night, uh, We were, I was done recording with Michelle, and you recommended uh, some movies to me to watch because I was home alone. And I got to thinking, because you see these movie settings of Chicago, Wisconsin, or even just stage sets, has Barkerville uh, have ever been the framework for movies? I know you're the best guy to talk to about this. So how, has there been many movies made inside Barkerville or about Barkerville that I'm just not aware of besides like maybe some documentaries I've seen? Oh, for sure. Yeah. No, there, there's been actually been quite a few films over the past 40 years uh, that have used Barkerville as a location shoot. Um, it's got some really great perks, uh, 107 authentic original buildings amongst <laughs> 135 wooden structures. So it really is like walking into a Hollywood movie set. Um, you know, the first time you walk up that street, it really reminds you of Wild West flicks you might have seen as a child or in your adulthood as well. <laughs> so it's it certainly has authenticity in spades. And th those feature films that do come in film in Barkerville, that is precisely what they're looking for. Um, now, of course, our relative remoteness and um, lack of three-phase power and all of that sort of thing can can make it a bit of a challenge. Um, but the, uh, the film companies that I have dealt with specifically over the last few years uh, have been really appreciative of, of the opportunity to come and film in Barkerville. But the there has been uh, quite a long-standing tradition. Uh, one of the earlier ones that I've seen, actually, very recently, is called El Hombre de Nudo, and it was a it was a Mexican film uh, that was made here in the late '70s, um, and uh, it was a sort of a, a very um, sort of blood and guts kind of old West Sergio sort. Leone type. Yeah, very similar to that. There are certainly some more familiar faces that have also uh, filmed here. Um, again, late seventies, early eighties, there was a whole series of films. Uh, one, uh, a very good uh, film. If you like the, the style, um, there was a, a, there's a director who cut his teeth on a sort of a gold rush Western called Eureka. Oh. Uh, in the late in the late seventies, that Gene Hackman was the star of actually. Um, really, so we had uh, yes, we had Gene Hackman here on set, uh, on location in Barkerville. I had a great opportunity to meet and hang out with an actor named Michael Hogan uh, a couple of years back at Northern FanCon in Prince George. Michael Hogan is most famously these days. He's a Canadian actor. Uh, but he's known for being Colonel Saul Ty on the new Battlestar Galactica television series that just okay. wrapped up a few, a few um, years ago. 
Um, and Michael Hogan was in a, a film here called Klondike Fever. And this is, a, this is a theme that you'll find throughout our discussion about the movies that are filmed in Barkerville. There have been a few, uh, Showdown at Williams Creek, for example, which at one time was called something different. Um, um, I can't remember what it was, but it's the direct or the DVD release was called Showdown at Williams Creek, and that actually had Barkerville playing Barkerville um, in, a, in an interesting sort of take on the gold rush Western genre. Uh, but more often than not, Barkerville doubles for other Western towns. Some of those would be fictional towns. In the case of Klondike Fever, um, it was Dawson City. So uh, right. it was Klondike Fever was really a, a Yukon gold rush story, but they used a closer uh, gold rush town <laughs> uh, to, to double for their historic scenes. And Klondike Fever, Michael Hogan had a smaller part in it, he was telling me, but it really allowed him to fall in love with the Wells Barkerville area. He was playing a uh, dog sled musher, I suppose, a guy who ran a, a team of dog sleds. And so he needed to learn how to use sled dogs. So he came up to Wells. Uh, this was, I think, the early late 80s or early 90s. He came up to Wells for three weeks before shooting even started and stayed in a cabin um, and learned how to, how to dog sled properly and used to hang out at the old Jacka Club's hotel, uh, one of the famous uh, pubs in the area that unfortunately burned down in 1993. Right. But uh, he, uh, he had a really great, uh, great opportunity to spend some time here and, and really sort of mix it up with the locals. He, he really had a lot of great things to say and then, and then filmed this movie, Klondike Fever, for a couple of weeks after his initial three-week stay. Uh, and Klondike Fever had a number of other, other famous actors in it at the time. Um, let's see what else. Oh, um, some of our listeners, if, if you are old enough, uh, may remember uh, Ricky Schroeder from the <laughs> television series Silver Spoons, and then later on NYPD Blue. Um, about 25 years ago, he made a, a version of Call of the Wild, the Jack London story um, about Jack London going up into the Yukon Gold Rush, and it was sort of the relationship between a man and his dog. Um, and Ricky Schroeder was the lead in that. That filmed in Barkerville. You've brought in quite a bit of... Um you brought in in your time of being in Barkerville again. Sorry, I, I'm in your second time of being in Barkerville, the, the second renaissance, as I will say. Uh, you brought in a lot of um, media and crews. And the one that always stuck in my head, and I actually got me a lot of street cred when I was a youth worker, was the Evil Ebenezer did a music vi oh, video yes. in Barkerville in 2010, was it? Yeah, it was 2010. Um, how that came about is that we started doing um, some promotional video work with a, a, with a company that no longer exists under its former name, but it was called JPS Media Works at the time. And uh, they fell in love with Barkerville, and so the, the two fellows who were working the camera for, for that particular outfit uh, pitched us on an idea of filming a documentary of our own, and maybe Barkerville co-producing a documentary about the historical gold rushes, really, the, both the 1860s and 70s and the 1930s gold rushes, but use it as, uh, or rather use a new lens to, to talk about that historical story, so we were able to uh, um, reach out to and get some fairly unprecedented access to a few local placer mines that that were working in the area between 2011 and 2013 and sort of get their story and then use that and this new footage that people have never really seen before as a means of ushering in the historical story as well. The, the film ultimately was called Wilds to Riches. So the film was narrated by a very good friend of Barkerville, a former CBC um, Almanac radio host Mark Forsyth, um, who along with his writing partner wrote a book called The Trail of 1858 uh, that came out in 2008 for BC's 150. Um, he was he's very interested in the origins of the Caribou Gold Rush. Um, so we, we we started filming this documentary, which ultimately actually uh, was picked up by CBC here in British Columbia and broadcast uh, throughout the province several times in 2013, uh, as well as across the world on CBC uh, satellite feed. But all of that is a, just a, a really cool way of saying, or rather a, a complicated way of saying that uh, through that process, um, one of the directors of Wilds to Riches, who had worked those promo shoots with us before, a fellow named Patrick Curling. He had grown up um, in Chilliwack with a fellow named Galen Bleasdale, 
who became a rapper, uh, and his his uh, stage <laughs> name is Evil Ebenezer. So uh, we had hired uh, Galen, or Evil, as we call him, uh, <laughs> to to come up. And by hired, I mean he volunteered, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we had we brought him up to play James Barry. Uh, coincidentally, uh, given our our conversation from last week, in some uh, reenactments of the Barry trial that we were doing. And he had been playing his latest CD. It, it was just, it hadn't dropped yet. It was just the, the sort of the fresh recordings um, all the way up to Barkerville because he drove up with the filmmakers. And they, they, they really started to glom on to this one track called Step Two, um, which had a really good beat. It was, it was really groovy. It was slightly different than some of the other stuff that he was doing. And just because of some of the lyrical content, they thought that filming a video in Barkerville for that song, Step Two, would be a really cool thing for us to do. And, and Evil was really on board with it. Um, we didn't have a lot of time because they were coming up basically for a two-day shoot. So, you know, throughout the day, we would shoot for, you know, the scenes that we needed for the documentary. And then in the early after, or rather late afternoon and early evening, uh, over two days, we shot this music video uh, which has Evil Ebenezer interacting with Barkerville characters, and you know, there's this wow. great hip hop beat that's going through it the whole time. We we got some really amazing locations, pretty much for the most part shot with natural light, except for a few of the scenes that we did in the house hotel saloon. And uh, it, that that video has been seen by more than sixty thousand people online over the last couple of years. It's uh, it's been really great, and like you say, it certainly lends cred to a certain section <laughs> of uh, of society when you say, "Oh yeah, by the way, we shot an evil Eben evil Ebenezer video here in in Barkerville," and that's uh, that actually opened the door for a, a few other music videos that we've done over the last few years. Most recently, um, last year in the spring, we shot a video um, that was actually supported by Telus Optic and their uh, their Story Hive um, or the the music video version of their Story Hive program. Um, Jer Brakes is the fellow's name. He's a, a local boy from Prince George who's made quite a name for himself working as a, um, a guitar player and a session musician in the country music industry in North America. And he's got a couple of albums of his own and he does play some solo shows and stuff. And so he had this song oh called Come Down that uh, that some friends of ours from Prince George wrote uh, a bit of a script for. It's sort of a steampunk uh, tale in a gold rush town. So again, it's set right in Barkerville, but it's about this guy who's come from the future searching for his long lost love who was somehow caught in a time vortex or something and wound up in Barkerville in the 1880s. So um, but I've, I've, I have worked um, as closely as I can with the, the Film Commission here in the Caribou, Chilcotin Coast Tourism Region. The Film Commission office is, is a part of the Caribou, Chilcotin Coast Tourism Association office. And Creative BC, which does a lot of the location scouting for the film industry in, in British Columbia. And as a result of that, we've had a few independent features that have come through. We had an international feature that filmed here in 2012. Um, uh, it's a, it was a German company um, that was filming a, a, a production called Gold. Um, Thomas Arslan's Gold. The writer-director was a fellow named Thomas Arslan, who's, who's quite popular in the sort of art house scene in okay. Berlin. And he had this epic idea to, to create this film that would be a German-Canadian co-production it would be filmed in both languages so the idea was it's a group of Germans who come over again for the Klondike gold rush so they're they're working their way through British Columbia and then up into the Yukon in order to look for Klondike gold so they spoke German to each other and then when they were interacting with anybody who were, were was on site here in what was British Columbia then they spoke English so they had a really nice mixture um, and, uh, there was a couple of fairly famous, um, German actors who were in the film. Um, uh, one of whom was, uh, they described her as the, the, uh, sort of the Berlin equivalent of Angelina Jolie. Like she had been oh. really popular, um, when she was a younger actor and then she'd taken some time off and this was kind of her stepping back into the, to the ring while she was in her mid, mid to late thirties at that time. Um, so they knew that the, the film would get a lot of attention. And as a result, um, it was actually it premiered at the Berlin Ali Festival, the Berlin International Film Festival, 
in uh, in 2013, I believe. Um, and uh, it was it, the the film itself got mixed reviews. Um, however, it was unilaterally people all of the reviewers said that the locations were gorgeous ah. and that they they really really were able to glom on to the authenticity of what that kind of journey would be all about i mean it was a i think part of the reason that the reviews were mixed is because it, it did follow some very conventional uh, Western tropes, and also it was incredibly bleak. There, you know, I, I've seen them film a few times. I actually play a bartender in a saloon in, <laughs> in in the movie, and it's not like a it's not a date movie. It's it's a movie about some very misguided people who come over from Europe for a gold rush, and pretty much all of them die by the end. It's not. Uh, it's not a super positive story, but it, but it is beautifully shot. And right. uh, if you do get a chance to ever see it, I would recommend it for sure. Uh, now, were you? Um, in 2006, did you, were you part of the, or 2000, yeah, 2006, there was a company that came in to film some school related material on the gold rush. Oh yeah. Clock Tower Images was the yes. name of that company actually. And I knew them already from Victoria. So yeah, just uh, to back up for a second, um, I, I became part of the Barkerville administrative team in 2009. And the last time we, Prior to that, that I had worked a full season uh, as a as an interpreter for the water back on the water wheel with Dave Brown actually uh, was 2006, and yeah, the, this fellow came up um, and um, it was Tim Sutherland who actually had been his contact because they had right. done some work together doing educational videos in Victoria previously. And so he got in touch with Tim and Tim sort of organized everything so that they could come up and film a couple of um, episodes of their, their educational series uh, here in Barkerville. And uh, that was a lot of fun, actually. I was, I was a part of that. Were you, though, did, were you the one that fired the gun in the saloon? Uh, yes, in fact, so I you, was the one who fired so the gun. You and you were the one who died. You shot me in a movie. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Because I, I had totally forgot I, about that. To be honest, when we started talking about this, I remembered. I was like, oh, right, we did film something because it was my first lesson in stunt work was I made this big, dramatic, like, awesome gunshot, and then I flopped right to my butt, except there's the bar, because it's an actual bar in the saloon. So I dropped, and I hit my butt on the metal railing, and then I slumped over, and I and I made it, made it look really sharp. And then I realized slowly, okay, set it up again. Okay, set it up again. And I realized I fell about 15 times, <laughs> and I had to make it look good. <laughs> Like that, and I go like, no wonder like some movies you see where the guy hits the stairs, and you're like, oh, that didn't that stunt guy really took it easy on himself, and then you go, wait a second, <laughs> that was probably his fifteenth time of doing it. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, I remember that. That was quite a, a complicated uh, little little uh, maneuver that we had to do there. And I, as, if I remember correctly, um, the the setup was the fact that I was uh, part of a sort of a little trio of ruffians who had planned on assassinating another guy at the bar. Yes. Wasn't that right? Yeah. It was. And so, and so yeah. Todd Church and you would pretend you were in a card fight. It wasn't it. Like it was you guys were, he yes. would accuse you of cheating or you accused yep. him of cheating. You pulled your pistol and they wanted to make it look like you were turning the gun away from shooting him and you were going to shoot the guy at the bar but you ended up shooting this hapless miner next to <laughs> next totally to by accident yeah. yes and uh we should probably mention that this is actually a historically documented event that happened it is yes <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't you know it, but it was it was really interesting to to do the choreography for that and and try to figure out how we were best going to show that. And then the most unfortunate thing about that entire shoot, I don't know if you knew this, the, the addendum to that was that the company that had hired Clock Tower to produce this educational video for them uh, wound up, this could be wrong, but it was something like this. They wound up in receivership. Oh, no. Um, so not, the, not Clock Tower images, the people who were filming, right. but the people who had hired them. And so there was a freeze put on all of that footage, and, and that uh, episode of the series was never actually produced. So all of that stuff that we did is just <laughs> sitting in somebody's computer somewhere, and uh, nobody's ever actually seen it other than the, the filmmakers themselves. Yeah, they were a great crew to work with. Yeah, they were. And I, I hope they're still. I hope they're still in operation in in Victoria. I, I I'm going to look that up actually because they. I remember a couple of times encountering them in Victoria and then having this really great opportunity to work with them here. Um, yeah. 
So a non-sponsored plug for Clock Tower Images. If you're still out there, we really like you guys. We, we want to hear from you. Just just let us know. Even just drop us a message. Just right. let us know if you're okay. Uh, it really stuck in my head last night about there has to have been movies filmed in Barkerville because the setting alone is fantastic. I, even the scenery, the mountains around Barkerville. I mean, uh, I, I don't know about you, but I know when I was an interpreter, I'd sit around and almost write screenplays all day of what you could do with Barkerville when you're sitting in there. Oh yeah, we we're definitely actually working on a couple ourselves. Um, oh, you know, really? just trying to figure. Yeah, um, uh, Danette and I actually have a, a a treatment that we're writing right now for a, a broad church style murder mystery uh, oh. that takes that takes place in a historic town. Um, so, like, not in. So the idea would be that the the person who's investigating a modern day murder would then also stumble upon a historical mystery that is somehow connected to the events that are happening now. And then, so you'd get, you get an opportunity to sort of phase in and out of real historical reenactments, you know, as we look into the past, but then blending with the costumed interpretation that's going on and sort of what's real and what isn't. And oh. so we sort of envision it as it about like an eight part uh, mini series. So we're going to, we're going to try to get that finished this winter and see uh, if there is some interest. And if there are people paying attention and in need of a, of a Western frontier town um, that they could, they could find us through social media and uh, contact us and talk about location shoots. Cause we're always open for that. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Well, uh, I really appreciate uh, you sitting down with me, James today. And uh, I wish you yourself a beautiful day because I know you will, because you're in Barkerville. Absolutely. You have a great day too, Matt. Take care. We'll be right back, but first, here's a word from our sponsor. If you've never been to the end of the road, you can't really describe the experience of having been there. And if you could go to the end of the road only to find what was over 150 years ago its own end of the road from the opposite direction, what would you think of that? Discover Barkerville Historic Town. Visit Parkerville. For more information, visit Parkerville.ca. Parkerville, a national historic site of Canada. Up next on History Town, we have the lovely and talented Michelle Leeferts. We discuss faith in Barkerville, missionary work, also her returning as an interpreter, her first time being the schoolhouse in the early 2000s. It's a great talk, and uh, I'm fortunate to have her on the podcast. Without any further ado... Here's Michelle. So usually I start the conversation by telling a story. I was coming off, when I first met you, I was coming off of working four and a half years as a youth worker. And it took a toll out of me, mentally. And you walked into the room. I was talking with Stuart Kaywood at the Streeter's Cabin right. on the side street. I just uh, was finished a contract and uh, I was sort of trying to debate what my next move would be. And Stuart and I are just chatting about the street interpretation. And he mentions your name and how wonderful you are Aww. and how positive you are. You walk in, uh, you surprised Stuart. You showed up a bit early, I think. Yeah. And you were like a tornado of positivity <laughs> that <laughs> uh, deep inside I was like jealous of. Because... <laughs> <laughs> At that point, I was just like, why does, why, do, why does she get to be so happy? And then I'm like, look how happy she is. And like, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, it immediately made me feel good. Oh, you good. talking to you made me feel good. And we didn't know each other. And I was like, yeah, like, yeah, everything's great. And everything is awesome. And uh, <laughs> I, I appreciated our brief time together because I walked away being like, what an awesome person that, you know, Michelle was. And how that's awesome. Well, that's really funny because I kind of um, had a similar experience just with um, how much you obviously meant to Stu and were familiar with Barkerville. And I was like, I want to be his friend. When, when do I get to be his friend? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're friends right now. Awesome. That's that's perfect. We we made the first steps of accepting friendship on Facebook, <laughs> which which is good. Now it's official. And. And I was joking with James that uh, you were texting me about the, the last podcast and I texted jokingly with James. I was like, I don't know why I was seeing a counselor like twice a month for a year. Like I just should just have conversations with Michelle because she made me feel a hundred times better. Oh, yay. 
Yay. Like, I would have saved so much money if I met you before. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm having a bad day. Can we talk? <laughs> uh, There's a lot of good in the world uh, to be so, found. <laughs> there is. Uh, now, speaking of good and who you are, uh, where were you born? Like, uh, I, I, because I don't really, we don't really know each other that well. So this is going to be great. Mm. We're going to get to know each other this next hour. Okay. Uh, so where were you born? I was actually born in Calgary. It was hard to not just say Fort Calgary just now. Um, <laughs> 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 I was born in Calgary, but I moved to uh, Vancouver Island. I think I was two when my parents moved. So I have no memories of Calgary. I, Victoria is where I have my growing up years. And uh, were you, did you, so you went to elementary school and high school in Victoria? I did, yes. I did French immersion up until grade, well, technically grade four, but then I went to a, I went to a terribly posh private girl school, darling. Um, oh. I went to St. Margaret's. I was a St. Margaret's girl. Um, and the headmistress decided to continue my French. So I had private French lessons. So I sort of have like up to grade seven French immersion. And then... Wow. That ended. Now, uh, my wife took uh, French immersion mm. and she has, she struggles doing math questions yes. for a while. Yes. She, she was, she was telling me that she had great difficulty. She has to do it in French. Yes. You have to translate when she the French up. into English and then, or the English into French and then do the math in French and then translate it back into a uh, totally. That's so funny. I had the same thing. Uh, was there anything else that you noticed that you struggled with because of French immersion or any things that you're successful with? Well, when I was 17, I went on a trip to Colombia in South America um, and picking up Spanish actually was really wonderful because I had the romantic language base with the French so that <laughs> I fell in love with South America and Spanish. And in fact, I was talking to people on Williams Creek today who were from Chile and that was awesome because I could just chat with them in Spanish. Now, did you do you have it in where some words you'll say in Spanish and some words you'll say in the French? Oh yes. Like, will you? Oh yes. Will you do like a mix? Oh yeah, totally. I do. And I, if I'm in one of the places, like if I'm in a French-speaking country, I stick with French pretty well. If I'm in a Spanish-speaking country, I can stick with the Spanish. But when I'm here and I'm trying to take the English into the Spanish or the French, I mix them up all the time. And then I just sound like a nerd. <laughs> Were you an only child growing up? Oh, no. No. I no. was forever in the shadow of my little brother, who beyond the age of five was always bigger than me. Uh, I, I mean, we're now, did he participate? Was he academically inclined as yourself? He's incredibly he smart. Um, he's got one of those brains that just is going all the time and he seems to get everything but he's not um the textbook academic he's one of those people who's like an outside the box thinker entrepreneur kind of he gets bored at jobs he's had every different job you can imagine um because he's too smart to stick with one wow yeah um so what was it like growing up then together? Oh, we like, hated each uh, other. My, are you a few years apart? You hated each other. Oh, we did. Yeah, we're three years apart. My parents had to stagger meal times because we couldn't even be at the same table as each other. So, <laughs> what? No. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. We're close now. Was but... it like? Fit... Hmm? Was it just like verbally taunting oh. each other, or was it well, tormenting? He was or... bigger than me, and I would out talk him. So he would get mad and punch me and then I would dramatize it and make it way worse. So like there's this one time when I was totally, it was so my fault. I was like, just like getting at him verbally, right? Just and provoking him to the point where he pushed me <laughs> and I had strategically placed myself at the top of the stairs. So I then rolled myself down the stairs, landing at the bottom with great tragedy and drama, whereupon, of course, my parents came upon me and he got in so much trouble. <laughs> hey, you went, where did you go to high school? I like, went to... Uh, which school did you go to? I went to Pacific Christian High School. What were the courses you were mostly interested in uh, high school? Uh, well, I was the 
awkward, weird geek kid who'd been to the girls' school and just wanted to go back and wear a uniform. And I hated boys because they were stupid and got in the way of my studies. And so I didn't really have many friends. So, of course, I went to theater because theater collects all of the weird people. It's, it's, a, real, awesome it's a lightning people. rod. I know. It's great. Yeah, it's... It's it's also too I think teachers I, I, because you're sort of like you outlandish kids just go into that classroom <laughs> and just create yes just just create go things do your you know creative thing whatever that is and just leave the rest of us alone oh did was that what your main focus was that you really you were in high school and you were like theater is what I want to do no no I actually hence my trip to South America I've been to South America five times actually I kept trying to be a missionary. And I oh. kept getting thwarted by getting sucked into theater. And then I'm like, um, excuse really? me, I thought we talked about this and you want me to be a missionary. And he's like, <laughs> <laughs> I have such different plans for you. <laughs> I, I do appreciate that you're, it's like the conversations you have with God are like merely like, come on, man. Like oh he's a gosh. landlord. <laughs> Honestly, I think the most thing that God does is he face palms when I talk to him. He's like, oh, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's probably just like, hey, I sent you over there to speak Spanish and you're teaching everybody the conjugate verbs in French. <laughs> yeah. And also, you were trying to put on a production of My Fair Lady, so give me a break here. You know what's so funny is that I went to South America um, for, like, sort of my big missionary stint thing, whatever, um, to work with street kids at this halfway house. Except when I got there, I was 21, and um, the garrijes had just taken over all of the foresty area right next to this finca, and they were like, hmm... Single, blonde, young, North American, prime kidnapping target. We're not putting you there. How about if you go work in the prison? Because that's safer. <laughs> what? What? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So in the, okay. in the prison. So I'm going into the prison every day instead of working with kids. And in my broken Spanish, I tried to explain I was a theater student at the university. And they understood I was a theater professor at the university. They were like, great. We've got a meeting with the Minister of Justice in three months. Can you put together a production on justice with the inmates? So that's what I did. What was the production? What was it like? What was it? I, I have to know. We devised a piece on justice, which then there was an election while in like the last two weeks that, well, it was earlier than I was supposed to leave. Um, and all of the paperwork stuff changed. They had to get me out of the country like so fast. So two days before this production was to go up in front of the justice minister, I had to leave the country. So I never got to see it. What? But it was pretty... Um, it was pretty strong because, of course, the it's vigil, um, Napoleonic justice down there. So you're guilty until proven innocent. And okay. they have some pretty strong feelings about justice. And it apparently shook some things up. Oh, well, we missed a big step. So you <laughs> went to high school yeah. and then you went to Trinity Western University. Uh, I ended up there, but I had sojourns. It took me a long time to get my undergrad. I had sojourns to... Um, <laughs> Where did I go first? Oh, I went to a Bible college in Edmonton. And okay. then I went to U of A. I got into the BFA program there. And then that kind of terrified me. So then I ran away to South America. And I was at a Spanish college there. Uh, and then I came back and went to Trinity to be practical and be an elementary school teacher. And I got through one term of that. Were your parents supportive the whole time talking about theater or were they, what were they, what were their goals for you to, as opposed to what the goals you did? Did they see you as like marrying and out of high school and having that kind of relate? Or oh, like, where did they see you? I, to their credit, uh, I think they were open to anything that made me happy. Really, I think that's where they were going and, and um, they would support me and whatever. My dad's an accountant and my mom's a nurse. My brother is like an entrepreneur. He's got his MBA. So they're all, I'm not going to say not artistic, but exactly. So I'm kind of this wild card. And they were all, I think, a little bit kind of, where did she come from? And then <laughs> I married a jazz musician whose father is also an accountant, whose mother is a teacher, whose brother is in business. Wow. Yeah. So we're sort of the black sheep. Oh, husband? Yeah. But you just told me boys were yucky and gross. When I was in uh, high school. When... 
I know, I know. Um, when They're did you meet your husband? Now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I've gained an appreciation. <laughs> My tastes have matured. <laughs> when did you do? How did you like meet your husband when you were in traveling abroad? Did you meet him when you were at a university? Uh, when did the this little relationship uh, spark? Um, well, he's a musician, and I was going to Bible college, trying to be a missionary, and I was dating a guy there who. Was not a right fit. I was in love with the idea of being in love, right? Anyways, we went Mm -hmm. to a concert at the church that I was going to, and there was this band who was doing their thing, and they have this opening number where they're they introduce like the guy from Saskatchewan, and they get all the Saskatchewan people cheering, and then they introduce the guy from Southern Alberta, and all the so there's more people cheering. Then they introduce the guy from Edmonton, and everybody goes wild, and then they introduce Dave who's from Duncan, BC, right? Well, by this point, I'm all whipped up and I'm like, I'm clapping, I'm standing up, I'm waving my arms and screaming. And I realize <laughs> I am the only one. There's like 400 people in this church <laughs> and I am the only one. And the guys stop playing and they just look at me because the whole shtick is that nobody's supposed to cheer and they have this whole thing that then goes on from there because nobody knows where Dave's from. So I've just killed their joke, right? Oh, <laughs> no. I grew up in Victoria and he's from Duncan on Vancouver Island. So that's how we like, you watched a man perform on stage too. Did you did you meet him backstage? You go like, hey, no, we got a date. He chased me up actually. He didn't even know my name. Oh. Um, but no, the guy I went to the concert with actually dumped me on choir tour two weeks later just because he wasn't ready for things. So he chased you. He did. I want to go into this just a bit because I just uh, <laughs> so he chased you. Did he woo you? Did he play like jazz outside your window? <laughs> what, what kind of what? And when you say jazz, this shows how musically like not inclined I am. I just went. He played jazz outside your window. I never asked what instrument. <laughs> like, what does what instrument does he play? He's a phone. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> no, he's a he's a pianist. Although he plays tons of instruments, oh. but his his main instrument is is a piano. We- Did he wheel up a piano and just start <laughs> playing music for you, or uh, yeah? Uh, no, he actually. Um, He came to my dorm and brought a red rose and sat on the steps until I would talk to him. Wow. Mm -hmm. Did you walk past him a few times? Did you? I was still trying to put things together with the guy who dumped me. Of course. Because somehow we're blind when those things happen. You know, it's right in front of your face and (laughs) somehow you don't notice. But um, Like literally. Literally. (laughs) Right in front of my face. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> but he he's you know i was 20 he was 21 and he basically right. said i know what i want and i want to date you and i'm not asking you for the rest of your life right now but i'm asking you for 110 percent tomorrow and then i'll take you out for dinner whatever you can say yes and we'll continue on from there or you can say no and you'll never see me again for the rest of your life wow i nearly wow, said no uh... yeah really yeah i'm glad i said yes and were you going on were you doing missionary work while you were dating him um i was at bible college and then i then i got into the, my um i was still doing theater at the college doing little skits and things right. and the the instructor said you should apply to u of a so i applied there and i got in and so my years in edmonton were educational years so you have kids yes you have two lovely daughters. You have a set of twins. I do. That's correct. Yes. Uh, wh- when were they born? They were born July 17th, 2003. Wow. Okay. They were born a day, but mine's, my birthday is July 18th, <gasps> not to brag, but oh. next time you, after your kid's birthday, maybe Just uh, remember it's yours. kick your old boy here, a little message, a little right. happy birthday. I could probably do that. Put a card uh, in the post. <laughs> so 2003 now was it a big surprise that you were having twins was it uh, a big shock <gasps> oh. yes uh it was a big shock <laughs> that we were having a child oh yes oh i was that just more you were um you were guys were had like a, a, a five you had like a plan and you're like this is our plan and then a child uh, uh well, life happened we were living in england and um, because I did my MFA over in London Um, and so we were living in England and 
I had, I was on tour with a Christmas show and then I was starting rehearsals for Romeo and Juliet, um, uh, end of January. And so we were approaching our thirties and it was like, we've always talked about if we have kids, if we have kids, if we have kids, we're both the eldest in our families. So it was a bit of pressure day after our wedding. Dave's mom said, when am I going to hear the pitter patter of little feet? So Dave got me a rabbit. <laughs> Um, so his mom could have little feet pitter pattering. <laughs> and then, yeah, nine years after that, uh, we were like, hmm, maybe we should think about this because it wouldn't necessarily come easily if we decided we did want to do it. So we thought we've never been on a proper beach holiday. Let's do a big holiday and we'll talk about this. I was on tour for six weeks. I was home for one night. Um, we got to the beach holiday and I sort of suddenly started, the pennies started to drop and I just looked at Dave. I'm like, I better not drink any more Mai Tais. And then we both cried. And then I got, after the holiday, I got back home and I called my girlfriend in Canada. And I was like, Anita, these things are happening to me. And there was a silence. And then she said, you go to the drugstore, you buy a stick and you pee on it. You call me back. <laughs> <laughs> and I was eight weeks pregnant and I had wow. no idea so I I mean I don't want to retrace anything and your and your daughters in the future may listen to this <laughs> but you had one night out of six weeks it only takes once Matt wow mm -hmm. I, I I I know <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, now you have what's their your daughter's names I have Rebecca and Madeline two daughters theater career where did you see it did you have like a moment of like i'm having twins what my time is now going to be very limited were you thinking maybe i'll do something else with theater maybe i'll do something else with acting or what were you thinking at that point i was thinking nothing beyond two babies what am i gonna <laughs> do with two babies i didn't even know that if i could manage one and I'm not a person who's typically drawn to kids. I'm sort of, you know, there's some people like, oh, a baby, let me hold the baby. And I'm like, oh, a baby. No, that's fine. Keep it over there, please. And suddenly I was going to be <laughs> responsible for two small humans. Did you have a little conversation with the man upstairs at that point? I imagine there was. Oh, oh, I meant... he got earfuls <laughs> on a regular basis. They were very damp <laughs> earfuls. No, they were soggy. They were positively like Sea of Galilee sort of earfuls. <laughs> We will hear more from Michelle. However, here first is a word from our sponsor. When you visit Barkerville Historic Town, you can step into the past and live a present that harkens to a future where the past and present poetically coexist. You'll know this is true when you visit any of our merchants and you can feast your wallet upon the latest household wares from the 1870s and then discreetly pay for them with your debit and credit cards. Visit Parkerville. The old is new is old again. For more information, visit Barkerville.ca. Barkerville, a National Historic Site of Canada. We return to the second half of the interview with Michelle Liefertz, where we discuss St. Xavier's Church, her thoughts of interpretation, and coming back to Barkerville. So how did you hear about Barkerville? Well, I heard about Barkerville in grade four. My first year at the, the Ponzi Girls School. Actually, I shouldn't say Ponzi. It was lovely. I loved it there. Um, and I wanted to go, I, as I said, I was that kind of weird fringe kid and I read all the time and I just devoured historical fiction and I heard about Barkerville and I just sort of went, oh, I need to go there. That's my place. And I never got mm. there. I never did. Um, and then in this, in the winter of 1998, I was doing a show at the Shimanis Theater with a woman named Lucia Frangioni. And um, the familiar, she's a playwright. She's a Canadian playwright, yeah. actor from Vancouver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she. What has she written? Oh, she's written Espresso, Caribou Magi, um, Why Are My Brain Going Blank, Paradise Gardens, um, In a Blue Moon is her production that just, um, it just clo closed. No, it's just going to open at Thousand Islands Playhouse in Gananaque, Ontario. Um, right. She's an astonishing wordsmith and playwright but artist she's an amazing actress as well singer um and just an astonishing person like she's just one of those i can't believe i know this person person you know 
And so I did this show with her when I was all starry eyed. I'm working with Lucia Frangioni. Ah! And um, and she had been up in Barkerville and she had the schoolhouse and Wendell House contract. And so she invited me to come and work in the uh, schoolhouse and Wendell House for the following season in 2000. Wow. Yeah. In, two th- in 2000? Yeah. So, uh, do you remember who you portrayed? I sure do. I played Mary Hasty. She's the sister of Elizabeth Hasty, who became Elizabeth Kelly. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, and a Scot- a fine Scottish lass. <laughs> did you, how was that? How was uh, how did you find it for I your first time? Loved it. I remember coming, and it was May the sixth because I arrived the day before uh, my sixth wedding anniversary, actually, and. I was walking up the street and the snowbanks just even coming in. I have a picture I'd gotten out of my car and I'm standing. No, I'm not. Okay. I'm not a tall person. I'm five, four, <laughs> but um, I had my arms outstretched like this because everybody can see the like this. Right. And um, the snowbanks were higher than my fingertips. So they were easily six feet. I, and I mean, it's the pack snow on the side of the road. Right. But so then I remember yeah. coming into those, wet muddy still kind of snowy streets of barkerville with shauna berry who was um the other person working there and she had picked me up and was introducing me to barkerville and it was so bizarre listening to james last podcast say how he walked in and felt like he'd already been there and i i was sitting in my car listening to that and i went what i never knew that that's what happened to me too because i was walking up i just passed the goldfields bakery and I had this weird flash thing where I, I remembered walking down the, the other direction from Chinatown towards the Goldfields Bakery. But I had never been to Barkerville before. I hadn't seen pictures of it. I, I was sadly underprepared in terms of doing my, my research. Um, but it was this very strange thing. Well, how was your first day of interpretation? I was terrified. On my, my very first day, I was in the Wendell House. Thankfully, Shauna was with me. Um, so we were playing these sisters. Um, and I remember this first school group coming in and just looking at them and thinking, they're going to know I'm a fake. <laughs> but then that's kind of how I feel whenever I do a show. It's that, <gasps> fooled them again. Which is kind of silly because, you know, it's my... It's my job, right? It's my profession. But there's that self-doubt that's so much part of the business. Well, especially when it comes to that, I find May 16th in Barkerville or May, whatever the middle of May when you first start Mm -hmm. and you put on those shoes, Ah. that's, there's some nerves there because you're walking out. I remember my first day, I was like, uh, um, I had my cost, I had my costume on and I went to the bakery and there was 35 kids in the piling into the bakery as I turned around with my coffee. And I froze. And they froze. And we all stared at each other like the standoff of who was going to talk first. And I immediately went, good day, kids. My name is Melbourne Bailey. And I'm a mom. And I start doing a speech. Mm-hmm. And the kids are like, uh-huh. Uh-huh. And then other kids are like, do we have to listen to this guy to get our <laughs> sticky bun? You know what's amazing? Like, is he the guardian of the bakery? <laughs> That's so funny. You know what's amazing to me about interpretation is that, to me, it is the most extreme form of acting. Because when you're doing a show at a theater, you have a set character who has a context of a period of time. You've got, you know, basically two hours. Your words are prescribed. Um, and it's it's a big job, a lot of work goes into it, but there's a safety built into that. Of Interpretation course. takes that to the outer reaches, right? Because you have to know your character so well. You have to know your history, your environment, uh, the social mores, the movement, all of this stuff so well that you are ready for any situation, anything anybody throws you to play that character truthfully whatever's thrown at you right and and because we're playing people who really lived there's that added responsibility of truthfulness to who they were right and without actually knowing them and it just i don't know and i've always been terrified of comedy improv like 
when I'm funny, it's usually accidental. It's not, I'm not good at, at like, just, okay, be funny. And I'm like, uh. and so that whole improv piece of it is terrifying, but that's the part I love the most. Oftentimes, especially as a woman um, on the creek, uh, and the creek, of course, is what we call Barkerville because Williams Creek encompassed the four towns, right? Um, and the things that people want to play, but they don't quite know how. And so often they'll do what seem inappropriate kind of things, right? But it comes from this place of wanting to engage. Yes. And I just find it so interesting that as an interpreter, you're sticking to the truth of the the time period and the person you're portraying. And yet you feel the the juxtaposition of the the modern day visitors wanting to be part of that and so saying but no who are you really because i want relationship and so figuring out and that's one of the interesting things about that interpretation because you know you can pull the whole oh you know we flew here what's fly of course people can't fly oh, oh, oh. you know but then that just makes people frustrated because then we've put up a barrier so it's like how do we find that way across the space-time continuum where we can cross over and back and still engage with people in their world, but invite them into ours. I, I used to tell people when I mm. used to get somebody who was really wanted to know, I would say, if I told you Harry Houdini would get into mm. a box and he had a key in his mouth, uh. what would you think about the trick then? Like a lot of the magic disappears. So I think sometimes it's easier to just go along ah. and, and they would instantly like catch on like, right. This yes. is, uh, there is a magic here of if I ask the right question, I can find out about the person, but directly I'm, yep. I, it's, it's almost like a labyrinth type puzzle. They have to figure out how to talk to you, but if you do it in mm -hmm. your terms, yes. then they can find out more information. And I think everybody wins then. Like that's, that's, what, that's the thing yeah. I'm always interested in discovering is how do we, how do we um, adjust this so that everybody wins? So that you go away feeling satisfied and still keep the magic. Right. And I still maintain the integrity of the character that I'm playing and the time period I'm in, inhabiting, you know. And I think that is part of the magic of Barkerville because I did some street interpretation in Shimanus where I live right now on Vancouver. Well, I mean, right now I live in Wells, but typically my home is in Shimanus. And that was really hard because it's a modern town. And I was portraying the 1880s when it, in its beginning. Interestingly, the man who founded mm -hmm. the town founded it with money. He was a miner in Barkerville in 63 and 64. And he saved the money he earned in Barkerville. And he moved to Vancouver Island and bought this massive piece of land on which he then built a sawmill and the town of Shimanus grew up. So there's like this direct link. I love, I love how it seems like all of BC history, it doesn't matter where, it's like that six degrees of separation, except instead of Kevin Bacon, we've got Barkerville, right? And, <laughs> but in BC, like, it's so exciting to go, yes, and it traces back to Barkerville. And this is where it all began. And this is why it's so important, right? Um, but when I was in Shamanus doing that, I just had me in a costume and telling the stories and we've got murals all around with the history but there's no there's no context for the visitor i'm trying to pull them in and that's taking you know 70 percent of my effort whereas here in barkerville they walk right. into the whole environment and they're already there like 90 percent of the work is done for you and it's just i just think it's so magical and then i i did that one season and it was i went till mid uh, september and then the end of September, I moved to London to start my MFA program at a drama school there. So it was kind of a big shift. And it was only supposed to be for the duration of my program. But then Dave got work. It was pretty great for a jazz musician to be living in London, England. And then I got work. And then we ended up staying. Right. And my heart just stayed in Barkerville. Like it, I was the, um, there's always Barkerville kids. So I don't know who the Barkerville kids were when you were there, but there's always the children of interpreters and merchants and things who are in costume. And they're just <clears throat> part of that, um, part of the, the fabric of the town. 
And the children who were there when I was okay, there yes. were uh, Oliver and Alice Rummel. Reba. And then Glenn Escott's kids, Caitlin and Angie and Reba. Reba Escott, yep, and Caitlin and Angie. So those were the kids in, in my season then. And Ale- Oliver, oh, <laughs> Oliver was six. And he just stole my heart. And he would come to the schoolhouse every day with a little fistful of buttercups and forget-me-nots and and give them to me. And he would help me down the stairs. And he even invited me to the fireman's ball, but then asked me to wait (laughs) till he was old enough to stay up that late. And it was just gorgeous. So when I moved to England, I wrote to them. And I would write to them as Miss Hasty, and they would write back to me. And I just, I couldn't leave Barkerville behind. So then when I realized we were staying in London... I started to, I went, you know what? We could, there's room for this here in London, I'm sure. So I developed a Victorian school program and and to go with the history um, curriculum in grade five or, you know, year five in England and did that there for a while. <laughs> and that was, there's a reason I'm bringing this up. And I well, I was talking because was. Uh, talk, talk, you, talk. Were, you, you took a break and then oh, we're in just between after you left Barkerville. And we're sort of in the part where you're in England. Uh, I was eventually going to ask you about returning to Barkerville. However, I think you may were trying to sense on something else. I don't know about after your first year, you just had one. You just did your first year. I just had the one. And then I moved. Yeah, then I moved to England um, and did the, the living history there. Now, something that is really funny that relates back to Barkerville is during that season when I was a school marm. Um, there, I got proposed to by this very earnest, beautiful little boy who was about nine, big dark eyes, and I remember him getting down on his knee oh. and taking my hand and asking me to marry him, which was just, I mean, oh my goodness, right? And this little boy's name was Patrick. And so I did my time in, in England, and I, like I say, I couldn't leave Barkerville behind, so I just kind of brought it with me, and I started doing interpretation, the school program in England. And when, and then we had our kids, and as you will find out if you have children, um, it's really great to have the grandparents around. So when our girls were two, three, uh, we moved back to Canada, just for a variety of reasons, but a big one was family. And I started working, we'd moved back to Shemanus. I started working at the Shemanus Theater. I was working um, one, one summer as the education coordinator and doing summer camps and things. And we, um, we were working with Camp Columbia to do the summer theater program. And I met the fellow heading it, a uh, guy named Pat Rundle. And as we were talking, we started, we came around to Barkerville and he said how much he loved it. And I said how I had been the school marm. And we started to count back. And we realized that I'm working with the kid who proposed to me. That's in awesome. 2000 in the schoolhouse. Yeah. Isn't that incredible? That's fantastic. I know. <laughs> so. Wow. Yeah. Oh, oh, well, that's a, uh, I will put that it's under really awesome interpreter story. Cause the, like, yeah, I mean, if you work one year in Barkville and you have that kind of a story, that's come on. That's a, that's like batting 300 in, in Major League Baseball for a season. That's amazing. Wow. Stuart has a, from meeting you and just having a conversation with you, Stuart's got a collection of heavy hitter interpreters because he has yourself, uh, Stuart, Danette, uh, Andrew, Brandon. Uh, yep. Is it Brandon or Bra- Brendan? Yep. Brendan. I, Brendan. I, I don't know. What, I feel bad. Sorry, Brendan. Yep. Uh, and you have a sixth person <laughs> who I haven't met yet, but Stuart has done nothing but yes. rave about him to me. Now that's like Rowan Keenan, amazing, amazing group of people. We, Brenda and I, were just talking about this today, and we just are floored every day at the incredible people we work with. There is not a diva amongst the cast. Everybody is so supportive and positive and strong and. Um, committed to the work and it's just I do not it doesn't matter what kind of day I've had if I've had a fight with my kids or whatever I walk into the back street on my way and I just grin like my face hurts from grinning because I can't believe how blessed I am to be working in Barkerville it's just (laughs) 
It's unbelievable. Uh, it's an embarrassment of riches. Now, Barkerville, the only time, like, I am a man, um, I visit church only when I was in Barkerville. We, we tried to continue a tradition in 2009 that every Sunday we'd go and support the reverend because awesome. what the Anglican church would do was bring in a seminary student or yeah. sometimes it was an actual reverend who was just, oh, here, have be here this summer. And he is not an interpreter. He is the right. actual, he's an actual reverend, but he's yeah. interpreting Reverend, uh, Reynard. Reverend Reynard, of course. Now, do you, because of this, do you find that, uh, uh, do you still go to, do you go to St. Saviour's on Sundays and that's your. Sure do. Yeah. It's a beautiful church, Absolutely. isn't it? Oh, it's amazing. And I'm one of those people who have always had to like touch the stone walls and touch the castle floors and things. And so I, I do, I go in and I just put my hands on the the benches and the windows. And I just think how many marriages, how many baptisms, how many mm -hmm. funerals, how many silent thank yous and cries have, have echoed through the walls of those church of that church, you know, you just, you breathe that in and you take a moment and just, are floored at the history around you and the story. Last week, I had people on the tour on the Saturday afternoon, two really lovely families that, you know, you do the tour and then sometimes people stay for questions afterwards and we're chatting away and I'm getting to know the kids and stuff. And then Sunday morning, we have a reverend who was away last week. And so I just kind of, you know, went through one of the services, kind of, I wouldn't say I led the service, but I kind of guided those of us who there's five or six of us who go regularly. So we're just about to start and the doors of the church open at the back and these two families walk in. They've decided to come to church. And there's this really awkward moment where they look and they go, oh, you. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, hi. And the first thing they say is, you're not English. And I'm like, <laughs> gigs up. This is, this is me. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> You know, it's been wonderful talking with you. We, um, I, like I said before, I met you and I realized that, like, how positive and um, incredible you are just in those few minutes because anybody who can walk into a room and brighten it when it's me, Stuart, and Andrew curmudgingly complaining about something i forget what we were talking it about it's my pleasure matt like i say finally i get a chance to be friends with you too because everybody <laughs> up here just oh matt quick oh matt quick and this name just you know brings smiles and slightly cheeky twinkles to their eyes so <laughs> I, thank you very much for sitting down with me and uh you have yourself a great night you too matt thank you michelle thank you History Town is made possible by hard work, dedication, and man hours of James Douglas and Dirk Van Stralen. Also, a special thank you to Debbie and Cyril Quick, Richard Wright, and to my lovely wife, Genevieve Quick. History Town would like to thank this week's guest. My name is Michelle Liefertz, and I play Bella Irvine Hurdy Gurdy Dancing Girl in Barkerville Historic Town and Park, Barkerville, BC. Well, that's it for this week's episode of History Town. I am your host, Matthew Quick. And next week, we are going to have a special treat. I worked for him for four years at the Newman and Wright Theatre Company. He is the owner and operator of the Theatre Royal in beautiful British Columbia. He also provides us music at the end of our episodes. I talk about him every week. I have his painting on my wall. I am a fan of this man. Uh, when he used to be come out at the theater, I used to introduce him every Saturday night, and perhaps I'll give it a try right now. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, Newman Wright Theater Company proudly gives to you its Colonel. He is like the stagecoach, ladies and gentlemen. He may not be the newest ride in the park, but he always has the longest lineup. Richard Wright! Richard Wright has written the book on Barkerville. He has also written books on the Overlanders. He has written multiple plays about the Caribou and Gold Rush. He is a documentarian. You can read all about his information at theaterroyal.ca and bonepicker.ca. He is fascinating. And he's a great, great guy. So he's on next week. Uh, now we're going to end the show. 
in honor of uh, Michelle's character who played a hurdy gurdy girl. I'm going to play a lovely song by the Wake Up Jacob Band, the Dancing Girls of the Caribou. This is your host, Matthew Quick, saying good day, folks. We are dancing girls in caribou and we're liked by all the men. In gumboots and a blanket coat and in the upper ten. We all of us have sweethearts, but the dearest of all to me is that young man who wistfully casts those sheep's eyes at me. Is that young man who wistfully casts those sheep's eyes at me? Oh, every night at eight o'clock we enter the saloon. Although it may be vacant and is crowded very soon. Then all the boys, they stare at us, but we do not mind that so. Like those four and twenty Welshmen all sitting in a row. Like those four and twenty Welshmen all sitting in a row. Oh, what a charming thing it is to have a pretty face. To know that one can kill as well in calico as lace. We steal the hearts of everyone, but the dearest of all to me is that dear boy with the curly head who loves me faithfully. Is that dear boy with the curly head who loves me faithfully. To all the boys of Caribou, this moral which is right. From the dancing gals of Caribou you may see on any night. Before we either give our hearts or yet our sympathy. You must be like this dear young man who spends his all on me. You must be like this dear young man who spends his all.